This is the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast that takes a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. My name is Aaron Morse, and this week we're celebrating a big weekend for the women's swimming and diving program as the Bobcats successfully defended their CBB meet title. Plus, the track and field teams impressed at the state meet with plenty of state titles to go around. And women's basketball won a thrilling game in a pack to the rafters alumni gym over rival Bowdoin. All that and more coming up on the Bates Bobcast. <laughs> The women's basketball team took on Bowdoin Friday night at a pack to the rafters alumni gym. The gym can hold a total of 839 people, and that's how many were on hand on Friday, with a number of fans having to be turned away at the door. In one of the most electrifying atmospheres the school has seen in many a year, the Bobcats prevailed over then number 10 nationally ranked Bowdoin by a final score of 72-57. to Senior captain Morgan Candy scored a game-high 19 points in the victory, and she joined us on the live web broadcast after the game. Take us through what a great team win this was, because I feel like everyone contributed. What does that say about this team? 7-0 now in NESCAC. Man, I just, we worked so hard. We worked so hard, and I don't know. I don't even know. We just, we came into this game hungry. This week, this uh, past week of practices has been so competitive, and man, we're just working, and it's just, it's paying off, and it's great. And you've won six of these seven games by double digits now. I mean, it's been a dominating effort in NESCAC play. What, what does that, I mean, this team, I mean, it seems like everything is clicking. What does that say about your ability to raise your game in conference play almost? Listen, I know you've heard this from everybody who's come on here, but we are never satisfied. Right. And that is something that just pushes us through everything. And we want it. We want it all. And every time we go in that locker room to talk stuff over, it's, yes, this was great, but this is what we need to do better. This is the next step. Let's level up our game. And it's just it's awesome. Well, speaking of that, what's the key to winning uh, Senior Day tomorrow, right? Colby. <laughs> same, listen, same mindset. Come in here. It's awesome to have alumni magic and senior magic. And I've been with Allison and Davina all four years. And, uh, like, we've had each other's backs this whole way through, pushed each other. Just it's amazing, and we just want to do it for our team and do it for each other. Well, any other thoughts have you made about this crowd? How about this crowd tonight, right? <laughs> it's awesome. I had to tell my parents to get here an hour early just in case. Um, it's I could not ask for a better atmosphere, a better place to play. It's amazing, and I'm so grateful to see all my friendly faces around. Morgan Kennedy, 19 points. That was a game high here tonight. Bobcats win 72-57. They are 7-0 in NESCAC. Thanks so much. Thank you. Although the Bobcats fell by two points the following day to Colby, they are still in first place in the NESCAC thanks to the tiebreaker with Bowdoin. And they sport a 19-3 record overall with two regular season games remaining. If the Bobcats can beat Trinity and Wesleyan on the road this weekend, they are assured the top seed in the upcoming NESCAC tournament. In men's hoops... Senior captain Simon McCormick was named the main co-player of the week for his performances at Bowdoin and Colby over the weekend. Although the Bobcats dropped both games, McCormick averaged 30 points a contest, including a career-high 36 against the Polar Bears. Bates will honor McCormick, Trace Gotham, Devin Harris, and Stephen Ward this Saturday when Bates hosts Wesleyan on Senior Day at 2 p.m. From the hardwood to the pool, it was a terrific weekend for the Bates women's swimming and diving team as the Bobcats successfully defended their CBB title Saturday against Colby and Bowden. Junior Sophie Castley was named the NESCAC Women's Swimming and Diving Performer of the Week as she shined in the backstroke. But there were a lot of impressive showings that led Bates to victory. Junior Stephanie Tropper won the 1,000-yard freestyle and then filled in in some races she doesn't only compete in, including the 100-yard freestyle, and scored big points for the Bobcats in those as well. And Stephanie Tropper is our female Bobcat of the Week. So yeah, I basically came into school thinking the 100 and 200 like, were my best events, and I really enjoyed swimming those. And I know in my first week, I chatted some with PC, being like, hey, I just need a lot of yards to be the best swimmer I can be. And I would also like to try out the mile. I've swam it like once in my life and had a really good time, and like I wouldn't mind doing it here and there. Not really expecting much of it. Um... And as the season went on my freshman year, I missed a lot of it being out sick. And finally, February came around for NESCACs, and I had just been mostly doing distance yardage and getting ready for it, and I just, that was my event. I swam it, and 
the mile just kind of stuck after that. After getting my B cut and then qualifying for nationals, it was just kind of like, you're not going to get rid of that. Um, and it's been really fun. I really enjoy distance swimming now, and I've really come around to love it. I love the people I swim with, and so that just makes it all worth it. Um, but this weekend, it was really nice. I He sent out our event list, and I was kind of shocked, and he said to practice, hey, did you see what I put you in for CBBs? And I was like, yeah, is there any reason? Like, what's going on? This is kind of crazy. No 500. Um, and he was like, yeah, we need to switch some things up to, like, get the best score possible, and I think it's good for you to, like, do another 100 and 200 before NESCACs just for relays and whatnot. And so I was like, hey, like – I don't, I don't mind taking out the 500, um, and it just kind of happened, and it was really fun. So yeah. Well, you still swam the 1,000 yard freestyle though. Yes, also, I so. didn't get out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that like having like you know three events there, two of which are sprints, but one's the, the more marathon type deal? Um, I really like it. I'd say the thousand is honestly my favorite. Mm. You have more time to settle in than you do in the 500, but it's not quite as long as the mile. And so it's really just that sweet spot that I enjoy and have fun with. Um, But it was really fun to just start the meet with a 50 in the relay and then build it up a little bit more. And then at the end, you're in the last two events, the 1,000 in the final relay. And so everybody's just, like, getting tired but really excited to just, like, watch it all go down. And so I just had a blast. I had been sitting around for a while after my first two races. Um... And then it was just time to go. I got in. I didn't really pace that much before. I was just like, I'm going to go have a good thousand. I've already been in the water, been warming up for a while, and just really went for it. So, yeah. Yeah, so you were in that first event of the day, the 200 medley, as part of that B relay that had the top B relay finish uh, in that relay. Until you, I assume you're freestyle for that, right? Yeah. And that and that's the anchor? Yeah. So what's it like being the anchor of a relay? That, that's pretty exciting, right? Um, It's really fun. I don't typically swim the medley relay. This mm. was pretty new. Um, And I just think it's really fun to finish it strong. It really came down to the last bit for all the teams. I know that PC at the beginning said – if it's getting close, like, do a fast start. Like, really push yourself. And I just wanted to see, like, what I could do. I had really no expectations. Like, the 50 has never really been my thing. Um, and I just wanted, like, went for it for fun. And I was like, we're going to do the best in this relay that we can. And that was a pretty cool split. It's something I didn't really think I would ever do. And it just really shocked me. And all my teammates were like, oh, my gosh, you just went to 23. And I was like no, that wasn't me. Like, are you looking at the right relay? And then I was like, what is going on? Was kind of like my first thought. I was like, is this right? And so it was just super cool and really great energy. Um, I love being on relays and finishing them off is just super fun. Anchoring is just like really fun. It's just coming down right to it. And yeah, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I know Peter mentioned that the team you know, took a lot of risks this week in terms of you know strategy or style and whatnot. Now, what did you notice? And they all paid off. What did you notice from you know everyone else as well? You know, it was so incredible to see everybody swim really fast this weekend. I think so many people on our team had amazing meets, and it was really cool to see everybody just come together. Just the women's team of these three teams on a huge pool. There's about seventy five of us on the deck, so the deck feels kind of empty at Colby (laughs) and it was just incredible to see our team come together and everybody was always up cheering and that's what really makes it worth it I think it was so much fun to just see a lot of people go best times and knowing that in well about a week and a half now we have NESCACs and people were already swimming fast it was a really good feeling and I'm really excited to see what the rest of our team does Excellent. Well, we had Julia Johnson on a few weeks back, and uh, you and Julia are both, well, you were a distance swimmer, still are, but <laughs> doing some more sprinting now, but you and Julia have primarily been distance swimmers during your time at Bates. You're both from Ohio. There's only a year that separates you two. Did you know each other growing up at all? I mean, Ohio's a big state, but then being here at Bates, what's that been like? So, yeah, Julia was on our rival high school team, okay. and I knew of her since the start. She was always, like, that really fast girl. And when I was coming to Bates, I actually reached out to her saying, hey, like, can you give me some more information? Like, I know we're not super close or anything. And I want to say she's one of the biggest reasons that I'm here. She was super helpful in everything. She told me about this school and really convinced me. And since coming here, we've been great training partners. And it's just been so much fun to swim with her every day. She makes 
the D squad just incredible. Like it's a world of difference swimming with her. And it's just been so much fun to like get closer. We knew each other in high school, but it was more like know of each other. We were never friends, always rival teammates. And so it's just been fun that we get to actually like be on a team and be cheering for each other instead of like against each other now. So yeah. So yeah, when you were looking at colleges, did you you knew Julia had gone to Bates kinda and was that something so you were like, okay, the East Coast, you know, that might be a possibility. What, what what appealed to you about coming out here? I I think it was difficult because I was applying to colleges during a COVID year. Sure. Yeah. And I didn't really visit anywhere. I walked around one other school and that was it. And the rest were just like Zoom tours and Zoom calls. And I think that made it really difficult. I wasn't really focused on location. I knew that Maine had always been like somewhere I'd wanted to visit or travel to. It wasn't like a make or break on location. And one night I just kind of settled down. I had talked to PC earlier in the day and they kind of needed a decision from all the schools I was looking at. And I was just like, you know what? I think, I think this is going to be the best fit. Like I'm going to go for it. And after that, I was just, I texted him the next day and I said, Hey, like, this is it. Like, let's get rolling. And then the decision stuck and that was it. And as a first year, you got to compete at nationals, right? Which is a pretty cool thing. What was that experience like? Um, well, my freshman year at nationals, I actually, the stomach flu. Oh, that's right. Oh, I think I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah. We got there the first day and everything was fine. And then the next morning I got very sick. I'll spare you the details, but (laughs) (laughs) I had to text PC in the morning saying, Hey, like something's up. And that day you don't have any events that's just like the day to settle in and get used to the pool and you know just get ready for the meet that's ahead and I was miserable I was in bed all day and they just left me there and they were like get better like we hope this resolves soon um and after that first day I still was not doing too well so we scratched my first event which was a 500 yeah Mm. and I didn't come out to the meet. I was still super sick. And then he was like, okay, what do you think you can do? Like, can you do this 200 on the second day? And I was like, yeah, I like, it's a 200. I'll survive. Like I'm fine enough. Like I'm better now. Um, and I did it. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. (laughs) Um, but I finished and it was super fun. It was just so much fun to be there. And then on the final day, it was like, okay, you've got the mile. Like you were just so ill in bed and now you have to swim a mile. Like, at your best, what's going to happen. Um, and I think it was just a great atmosphere. It was super cool to qualify individually and just be there with the team. I think we had a lot of great people going that year, and it was so much fun just overall to get that experience. I think I was so, so lucky to have it happen. And, yeah, I just felt really lucky and really honored to be there. You say you swam a 200. Was that part of a relay or was that a that was individual? individual? Okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. So you've been doing the 200 a few times since yeah. throughout your t- career, but the 100 was sort of newer for you. Yeah. Gotcha. And then, well, I know it's up to coach, but I mean, what are your thoughts on Nescast coming up and what you might be able to contribute there, right? Um, <laughs> so as of right now, he's just sent out some of our relays. Oh, yeah. And our individuals, we're kind of stuck deciding, I'm going to do the 500, the mile, and we're kind of stuck on the second day. Mm. Um, whether that'll be a thousand or a two hundred, because at NSCX you can score in three individuals, and then some relays, but you can swim as many events as you like. They oh, just okay. have to be exhibition. Um, and so we've always put me in all the freestyle events just as like warm ups for the longer things, um, and just exhibition those. But this year we're deciding whether to be the two hundred or the thousand. Um, haven't made the decision yet, but. We'll see in the coming days. I'm going to have some more talks with him, but yeah. Gotcha. When it's an exhibition, obviously you can't score points, but can you still get like B cuts and stuff? Yeah, you can. Okay, nice. Yeah. Excellent. So there's value in that, yeah. certainly. Um, so you obviously you swim freestyle. Yeah. Have you ever considered other strokes? Have you ever even tried other strokes? <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was younger, I did a little bit of backstroke and butterfly here and there. They mm. were never pretty. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're just not my thing. I'll always be... Uh, freestyler we do something called like specialty work in practice and that's your stroke that's non-freestyle like a lot of people who just like swim backstroke that's like they'll do their 50s backstroke then um and whenever it's written specialty I look at him I go does it have to be stroke and it's always yes do something 
And I'll end up doing backstroke there. It's never pretty. Um, but my specialty, I like to say it's sprinting. I can I do the long things, but my specialty is sprinting. But I never really get away with that. And so I do some backstroke here and there, but that is about it. How did you first get into competitive swimming growing up? Um, when I was little, my mom put me and my brothers in swim lessons. Um, she thought it was a life skill more right. than anything. She was like, I want you guys to know how to swim. It's really important that no matter where you are, you guys are safer on water, and I want you to be comfortable. And once she did that, we took swim lessons for years, and then eventually she put us on a club team when we were all really little. And that's where we met my coach, who I had from the age of four to 17. Mm. He had been my coach for all those years and was a really big reason why I stuck with swimming because he just like would consistently show us the next step and like where I was going to go with that. Um, Eventually my brothers stopped swimming just to play other sports, do other things. Um, But I really stuck with it. I, it had been something I had always enjoyed. It never was like a chore to me. It was always my favorite sport I played. Um, And so I think just having a good coach from the start is what like kept me sticking through it all the way. And I met a lot of great people through swimming. And I think that's what was also another big reason why I just like kept going through the years. And then we got to college, obviously new coaching staff now. Mm-hmm. What's, what was the transition like for you? Uh, you're that first year and how, how has it been compared to, you know, growing up? Um, I know that when we get to school, we always have meetings with like our coaches. And one of the big things I said to him, I was like, I want you to be more than a coach like I don't want someone who just like yells at me on the pool deck and it's just like do this set do that set do whatever and then you're done and like there's no other relationship between just like do the set and get out of here um and that was a big thing coming in for me and I felt that from PC before I had even got here like on the zoom calls on anytime he'd reached out to us it was always very much just like very outgoing very just like enthusiastic about everybody swimming and I think throughout the freshman year he was always very caring of everything that like I did and if I reached out to him saying hey I'm like really sick right now he would be like are you okay do you need anything like can I do anything for you and that was just like really showed how you know even if like he can be tough during practice he can be hard like he really does care and wants the best for his team um, and I think as the years progress now, it's just, we have a really great relationship and can like laugh at each other and like poke fun at each other. And I'll always go up to him and say, is this sprinting? Like, can I sprint today? And that's like our big joke because I'll never really be a sprinter. Um, but he really cares. And I think he makes it a point to make a relationship with all of his swimmers. And I think it's a really great way, like that really is great for the team dynamic. I think... PC just like really lightens the mood and yeah I think he just is a good guy who like wants the best for everybody and I think it's been really awesome to just like develop a relationship through the years and now we can poke fun at each other and it's not just like I'm not just there for him to be my coach like he's a lot more than just your swim coach who yells at you on the deck. Awesome. Well, just any other thoughts you want to share on the CBB meet we haven't got to talk about yet? Obviously, it's another championship for the Bobcats there. I just think it was incredible. It was such good energy, and there was a lot of incredible swims. Like, we just saw that Sophie was a NESCAC swimmer right. of the week, which has been awesome. She just amazes us every single day. Um, and I think there was just a lot of swims that showed how hard we've been working this season. I think it's been a tough season because we've just – been working very hard and watching it all like really start to pay off in these big meets at the end is just so incredible and I really can't wait to see like what's going to come at NESCAX I just think when things are finally paying off and you're starting to see those times and you're seeing people like swim well it's just so much fun and it really makes me love this team because everybody had the energy everybody was just going after it we weren't there to just swim our best and win some events we were just going after it in every single aspect we were cheering the loudest like being there for everybody and it was just so much fun really fighting for every single swim we had awesome stephanie dropper our female bobcat of the week thanks so much thank you head coach peter casaris was thrilled with his team's performance and with the men's cbb meet set for this friday and saturday at tarbell pool he joined the bobcast to give us an update on all things bait swimming 
you mentioned something about taking risks and it paying off. What do you kind of, could you elaborate a little bit on that in terms of what risks the team was able to take and what led them to victory there? Yeah, so we talked a lot about like showing up to a big important meet and um, seeing how it goes and if we're fast or not, or like saying, I want this, I'm gonna make it happen. And I saw women swimming at that meet um, in charge and on a mission as opposed to hopeful, you know, I feel pretty good, so this could go well. Like that, that is, that's part of the swimming culture is like you want to feel good. You want to hit your taper. You want to, you want to have the season give you confidence so you believe in yourself. But when you're actually going out there and saying, I've got this, I know I can swim this, um, you see a little bit of a change in how they take races out, the, the chances they take. And like I just saw some women with some sheer determination. Um, and like one of, the, one of the swims that I think really um, opened my eyes to that was Liana Rossman in the 100 free. I mean, she just took that first heat of the 100 freestylers and was like, I'm out and I'm going for it and everybody chased me um, and had no, no waiver at the end, just still held on. Um, and I thought to myself when I saw that, man, we're about halfway through the meet and this is what I've been seeing. And, it's, and it continued on and I think they inspired each other. Um, they swam aggressively, but not out of control. Um, you can you can be in the best shape of your life and still die in a race if you don't swim it correctly, if you don't if you don't manage it right. And so it's a really fine line between I'm going to go fast, um, but I still have to have something left. I mean, you're diving into a pool, you're not breathing every stroke, like you're underwater and um, and you're trying to grab something that slips through your fingers. So you can you really have to have that flow, have that connection, um, and be taking a risk and be aggressive. And that fine line um, is something that if you wait around for it to come, it can. People have swam great in this sport and, and not expected it. Um, and that's dangerous because then they think, okay, maybe that will happen again. Um, the ones that go out and get it, even if it hurts or if it doesn't feel right, are the ones I want to build my team around. And I felt like our women did that this weekend. Sophie Cassidy was named the NESCAC Women's Swimming and Diving Performer of the Week uh, for the second time in her career. Um, obviously, she dominated the backstroke as she normally does, but take us through what um, made the meet so good for her. Uh, Sophie um, was abroad for a semester, came back and joined us on our training trip, um, and has been taking the right steps along the way and doing every little thing she possibly can. Um, we had a really good conversation last week, and, and she really, you know... Um, expressed to me her desire to, to be a tremendous teammate and supportive and to and to have a lot of fun racing besides her teammates and, and really going for it. And I think she stepped up this weekend um, and thought about what does the team need and, and how can I do this and um, swam her races. And, you know, backstroke in this, in this meet this weekend, it was hers to lose, really. Like, she's that good. Um, but she didn't take anything for granted and she went out after it and – um, she performed well, and she posted a, a top 15 time in the country in the 100 back. Um, and we worked really hard last week in the pool just to make sure that the women were a little tired going into this meet because we didn't want this to be our highlight of the year. We wanted NESCAX to be. So we hit them a little harder than we did previous years, and they responded really well. And Castley won her events, and then she dove in at the end on the two free relay, which really just kind of tipped the scales and popped a 23-8 um, and really kind of helped us get into the lead on that relay. And then the women held on to it the rest of the way after her second leg. Um, and I just thought it was just like, hey, here's somebody that doesn't just do the event that comes easy to her, the backstroke. She's going to go after it um, and and do it in the freestyle too. And as a side note, backstroke does not come easy to her. She works her tail off mm -hmm. for that. But it's her stroke and people will think like, oh, that's what she's, you know, that's that's her strength and that's what should happen. Um, but it was really just, a, it was a great meet and a, in a great step in the right direction for her to get us thinking about nationals and, and getting her to that level to get us thinking about NESCACs and making sure we're in the right position. And, you know, she was one of many this weekend that really stepped it up and then had some of that um, national ranking stuff that I think turned some coaches heads in the NESCAC and said, you know, we're going to vote for her. Stephanie Tropper uh, told me that you kind of surprised her with uh, some of the events she was swimming there, the 100 free, <laughs> for us being an example of But she stepped up big too, right? And what can you say about someone who's been mostly a distance swimmer for you uh, stepping up in the sprints? Well, Trop is um, a distance swimmer with a sprinter's brain. Right. You know, she's been in the corner, like, yelling at me she's a sprinter, half-jokingly since day one. Um, 
because she's fast and um, she she's good and you know she reminds me of you know Mark Gregory where you can win win the mile um, set the school record um, and you can also be the third fastest split in the hundred free on the team which is a pure sprint event um, and so we we pride ourselves in this program in that type of versatility you might be um, a thousand miler and that's what's getting you to nationals but you're not gonna you're not gonna miss out on the 50, 100, 200 work um, because we might need you on a relay. Or in this case, hey, we're moving Grace over to the 500 um, and Tropper, we're gonna move you into the 100. Um, and I had that versatility because the women on this team do believe in being great at more than one thing. And um, she's been fast and she's popped times throughout the year that made me go, well, she's gonna be on our four free relay. She's gonna be on our two free relay. We might as well throw her in this individually. Um, and, you know, her typical event lineup is 1,500. Um, and so for her to do the 200, 100, and the, and the 1,000, um, kind of skipping that 500 maybe made her open her eyes. But I think it also showed her that, you know, I believe in her and um, she's fast. And maybe I know what I'm doing every now and then. Well, and then Grace Wenger just does everything for you I and mean, continues to do that. I mean, uh, she might be the um, MVP of the team, if not all of Bates Athletics, with what she's able to do, right? I mean, Grace is um, perfectly named. You know, she is she is Grace in motion in the water, and, and she's also just a phenomenal teammate. And so I think anybody that swims in a lane with her gets better, um, in practice, I think anybody that swims on a relay with her steps it up a little bit. Um, and I think when she comes to meets, she is so dependable and she's ready to do what it takes. Um, and I can throw her in a 50 or a 500. I can have her do three individual events or I can have her do four, um, two relays and two individual events. It's like whatever I throw at her, um, I know I've got a chance for her to win the races and that if it's close at the end, She'll pull a wanger, hold her breath, and do whatever it takes to touch somebody out. And um, I don't think there's any way to measure the impact she's had on this team, Um, but I'm seeing it this year, especially in her senior year, as the captain and a leader um, and somebody that is willing to to sprint for us or do an event that takes over five minutes. So if she can win a race that takes 23 seconds and she can win a race that takes five minutes, it just shows that... um, She's doing it all. And like, if you think about it, uh, it's really hard to train for both of those. Like you're usually doing one or the other. You're in the sprint lanes, always going fast. Talk to Max Corey. Like all he wants to do is 50. A hundred is too long coach, you know? (laughs) And then, you know, and then you talk to people that do the 500, you know, talk to uh, Julia Johnson or Matt Kunkowitz or, um, you know, Gregory, they want to do yards and yards and yards to make sure that they have the confidence and endurance. Um, And Grace has been, um, totally okay staying right in the middle. Like I will train 200, 500, and I will be fast in the 50 and my 100, and I know that. And um, we've uh, we've been really lucky and blessed to have her on the team, and we're going to really enjoy this these next couple weeks with her here. Yeah, so NESCAC's coming up for the women later this month. Um, NESCACs are almost more challenging than nationals, it seems like, in terms of getting points and scoring uh, there. Um, what are your thoughts on how the team's lining up for the NESCAC championship? Uh, they look really good. Um, I mean, we're nine days away right now, so yeah. it's it, it it's amazing to me that it's it's really just that close. Um, NESCACs is hard for us um, in terms of the depth that exists in the conference. You can bring twenty four to NESCAC championships, and a lot of the teams um, are bringing twenty four women that can score, and we're trying to get all of our women to score. And so when you go and look at our team right now, we're really strong in the dual meet world because they score first through fifth in an event. Mm-hmm. At NESCACs, it's first through 24th. So um, we, we are going to have to really see um, our numbers 12 through 24 do something special and be like, um, I might not be Grace, Soph, Trop, like, but I'm going to be scoring points. And if enough of them do that, and we crash into the B and C finals where people don't expect us, then we have a really good overall NESCAC team. If if we are just outside, and last year was, was an eye-opener for us, we had a lot of 25ths mm. and a lot of 25ths through 30ths. And, I, and I'm just, you know, I'm hoping that what we did this year in our change of training and 
um, some of our um, conversations and goals is like really help everybody understand that there is a spot in that top 24 for me. I have to go out and get it. And if we can, if we can get those spots, we're going to score more points than last year and do better. If we don't, hell, we've got some really fast people that are going to help propel us onto nationals. But I think the team as a whole is going, we want to be a team of the many, not of the few. And, and that's been the underlining kind of message is if this program is going to take a next step and be top 10 in the country someday, it can't be the top six or seven that do it. It has to be 15 to 18. It's got to be 20 of you doing it. And someday all 24 will score again. I think back in 2015, we had all 24 score and we got second at NESCAC. Right. And, and that is what it takes. It's depth at the NESCAC level, not star power. Um, and that year, I think we only sent four to nationals. Mm. So we've sent 10 to nationals before and finished fifth. We've sent four to nationals and finished second. And right. that's what the NESCAC is all about. It's like a lot of very talented women from 11 different schools all just showing their strengths and their talents. Um, and it gets to be really difficult. So I think they've got the mentality after what I saw this weekend. And I hope we carry it into NESCACs. We've got some exciting action at Tarbell Pool this weekend. The men's CBB meet, hosted by the Bobcats, is this Saturday. You also have Diving Friday night. But take us through what you're most looking forward to seeing from the men's team this weekend. Uh, they are um, they're kind of in this mode right now where uh, they believe in themselves. Um, and they are excited to see what they can do. And um, I think... I think it's going to be a special weekend for them. For us to be hosting it here at our pool um, and Colby being as good as they are. I mean, Colby's, you know, top 20 in the country right now. And um, they're they're in a meat simulator on paper, you know, 30 points better than us. I think our men are ready to go. <laughs> Did you forget about us? Because here we are. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's going to be a close one when it all comes down to it. Last year... Um, it came down to the last relay, and Colby went the fifth fastest time in the country to beat us. Um, two years prior to that, the meet came down to the last race here at, 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 at Tarbell, and um, our men pulled out the victory on the last race. I, I assume it's going to be very similar again, and um, there's just a lot of talent now up there in Waterville. Um, Brad at Bowdoin's got a lot of um, national-level athletes, too, and again in a dual meet. You only need a couple to come out victorious. So I think it's just going to be a dogfight. Um, and I'm hoping if a bunch of cats show up, they can they can hunt better than dogs can. You know? <laughs> Sounds good. Peter Casares, thanks so much for joining us on Bobcats. Really appreciate it. You bet, man. Have a great one and come out to the meet on Saturday. On the track, both the men's and women's teams took second in the main state meet on Saturday. There were a number of standout performances, with junior Truman Williams winning the state title in the 400 meters. Sophomore Rasta Hayter prevailing in the 800 meters, and senior captain James Guiney taking home the top spot in the Peter Duran weight throw. But it was the Al Nicholson shot put that made headlines, with first-year Matt Sharpentier winning the event with a top heave of 51 feet, 8.5 inches, which is 15.76 meters. Good for 10th on the Bates' all-time performance list. And Matt Sharpentier is our male Bobcat of the Week. Well, Matt, first of all, I mean, you're a first year here at Bates, and this past weekend at the Main State Meet, you threw the 10th best uh, shot put in indoor men's track and field history here at Bates as a rookie. So what does that mean to you to get on the top 10 list uh, right away here? It was always my goal, actually, coming in to yeah. get on the top 10 list for indoor. And it was very surreal. Like, it felt great, and it was probably one of my better like technical throws and right when I released it it was effortless and like I knew like right when I uh landed that yeah it was gonna be good so yeah one thing we were talking about off the air is that the shot put in college is about four pounds heavier than the shot put in high school so what's that adjustment been like uh, for you from a training perspective so because of football I didn't have as much training as the other throwers did so I've only had probably about two and a half, three months of training, and they've been training since they got here. So yeah. they have a little bit of an advantage on me. But, yeah, the training with a 16 is a lot more difficult than training with a 12. With a 12, you could muscle it a lot more, and you could kind of, like, you know, get away with small, like, technical flaws. But with a 16, you can't do that. So the first month was really me just trying to get used to the heavier implement being slower and 
you know, making sure my coordination was good because obviously, again, different, can't be as fast and as powerful. So it just had to focus a lot more on technique. Take us back when you were growing up. I know you're a multi-sport athlete here at Bates, football in the fall. Growing up, I guess, when did you start football? When did you start throwing? Uh, football, I started in third grade. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I've been doing it since then. And for track, I've only started since freshman year of high school. Okay. Yep. So very, very new for me. So when you came into high school, what made you inspired to start, uh, you know, doing the throws? So when I was in high school, um, I was originally a basketball player and I tried out for basketball, but uh, I didn't really like the coaches and it didn't really go how I wanted it to. <laughs> Stuff changed. So um, I was then interested in wrestling, but mm. then uh, I started talking with the throws coach for my high school and I really liked her. She was super, super conversational and was very like, like ambitious and determined as a coach. And I really like fed off of that. So I really wanted to work with her and she said that I could be a really good thrower and I took it to heart and I was like, okay, I'll try. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just go on to wrestling and maybe something else. But yeah, I'm glad in the end I stuck with a track. Yeah. So once you picked up throwing as you went along in high school, when did you start realize, Hey, I can, I could do this in college. Yeah. Um, sophomore year was when I really realized it because freshman, freshman uh, year of high school, I was I was decent, but you know, obviously first year ever doing it, there was still a lot that needed to get worked on. But um freshman year I was a glider, so it's a different kind of form. Mm. And then sophomore year I changed up to the spin because I thought I could build up a lot more power like that. So then sophomore year for outdoor, I did the spin for a year and I threw fifty two feet eight inches, which was a ten foot um best compared to freshman year nice yeah so (laughs) it yeah i then started getting some attention from schools like humane and Mm. others and and bates obviously after sophomore year is really when recruiting kicked up and i was like wow i didn't think like i thought it was okay but i was like wow i didn't really think i was that good (laughs) to go off and compete in college so it was very eye-opening in the end of sophomore year and we were talking off air about how Bates gave you an opportunity to not only continue your throwing career, but also to hear your football career. And so yeah. you know, what's happened like, you know, you know, your first year here at Bates kind of balancing those two? Because you mentioned, obviously, you didn't get the shot put training you might have normally done in the fall because of the football season. But I'm sure you still love being out there on the football field, right? So, yes. Yeah. So um, the transition from high school <laughs> to college, obviously, much different than yeah in high school. So... I thought I knew what I was going to expect coming in, but, um, yeah, no, nah, really, really not what I expected. A lot harder. Mm. Um, time management was a big problem in the beginning of my semester because I had all this free time and I was like, oh, I could just do, you know, I, I could like just take some time off and like hang out with some friends or other things like that. And then I was like, oh, well now I got practice and that's three and a half hours long. And, <laughs> and then, um. Yeah, and then usually do some throwing after that as well, just by myself. And I was like, yeah, can't continue doing that. <laughs> so, yeah, transitioning from high school to college was pretty big and was something I did not expect. <laughs> and now your shot put each and every week has gone farther and farther. Um, yeah, it's it must be nice to see that progress each week, right? It It is very nice, yeah. yes. But the past two meets, I've had two fouls that, would have gotten me over 16 meters, which would probably qualify me for nationals. Oh, wow. So it's been a little annoying. Close. Yeah, 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 yeah. Close. It's very close. It's right. a little annoying yeah. after every meet where I have, like, a really big throw and then I foul and I'm like, oh, shucks. Like, right, right. Come on. Um, so, yeah, me and my coach are really trying to work on me keeping that that big throw so then I can uh, hopefully go to nationals because that was my goal coming in sure. to college was to go to nationals for my first year yeah. for indoor and outdoor. Absolutely. Well, Danny Kalina obviously is our throws coach. What's it like working with him? Oh, I've actually worked with him since sophomore year of high school. Oh, no kidding. Not, okay. Not, yep. Um, I would do some private coaching with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've always loved the guy. He's a great guy, really good coach. And I like how he's brutally honest, you know, because I don't like coaches that are like, oh, yeah, it looks good. If, if I screw up on something, he's like, yeah, Matt, you screwed up. You got to fix it up. And I'm like, okay, coach. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Now, um, in terms of the legacy of throwers here at Bates, how familiar are you with it? Have you heard from any of the alums yet? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm very familiar with it. So, 
if I'm not mistaken, Ira was recently on the podcast. Sure, yeah. Yes. Yep. So I talked with him a fair amount because obviously his son came in sure. and was a great thrower and was yep. a shot putter. And I talked to him sometimes uh, about his son's reaction to my throws and stuff. And he's like, oh, no, like, I'm not going to have my place for much longer. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, I'm coming after your son. <laughs> but um, I also talked to uh, Nick and Adire, which Adire, are yeah. very recent throwers sure. from 2016. Yep. All of them, um, very, very supportive, great guys. All guys that, like, I can, like, identify with. Because, like, we've, we have we both, or all of us share, like, the same goal, which was, you know, obviously etch our name to the record books and continue on the throwing legacy that we've had since 1935. Sure. Yep. And, yeah, um, it, it, it can be a lot, you know, to process. Like, wow, I'm a freshman and, like, all these alumni are talking to me and they have a lot of faith in me and stuff like that. But, honestly, it keeps me motivated because it, it shows that I'm keeping the legacy alive along with the other throwers. And we're making the alumni proud, so that's all I want to do, along with, you know, of course, making my coach and teammates proud and my family, of course. Certainly. Yeah. Well, we talked a lot about shot put. Obviously, there's other events. You also compete in the weight throw. And yes. then outdoor season, we've got the hammer throw and the discus on tap. So tell me about the other events besides shot put. Is shot put your main event, or are there other ones? I would say shot is my main yeah, event. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at discus, but... I haven't re- I haven't thrown a two K yet, so I don't oh. know how that's going to be heavier as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and weight and hammer, we don't have that in Maine. There's only like six states that allow it because it's very dangerous. Sure. Obviously. So this year is um, it's it's been very very hard because you know weight throw is very physically draining and you have to do a whole different kind of technique with it and you know trying to pick that up in one year and especially in the short amount of time that I've had to train. It's very hard, yeah. so it's been a little. It's been on and off. Like the past two weeks, I haven't really been on top of it because the first three meets I had, I PR'd in the weight. But yeah, since then it hasn't been fantastic, but it hasn't been terrible. So you're a true rookie in the weight. Like, yeah, this is brand oh, new yeah. for you. No, I, I yeah. am as rookie as it gets. <laughs> yes. So you pick up that weight for the first time here at Bates. What are you thinking? Like, what do you gotta do? <laughs> I'm just hoping that I can keep up with my team. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. what I'm thinking because we have two 17 meter throwers. Sure. And then we have Dylan, who's a freshman, who's throwing at 50 feet right now, which is very impressive. And I'm like. And I'm right there, like right beneath them, and I'm like, oh, like this feels terrible. Like I want to be with them in the competition. <laughs> Excellent. Then I'm um, just kind of like the throws group as a whole. Was what's the dynamic like? You know, with James being one of the with one of the captains, and uh, you've got Jacob in there as well, and you mentioned Dylan, another first year. What's what's the group like? Oh, we're a very fun group. Yeah. Um, me and Jacob, I would say, are probably like we're friends, but like we we want to like beat each other yeah. at every meet and, and at practice and the shot put because he's right behind me and he's catching up. And then with James, like, he's a really nice guy, really funny, but I can't compete with him in the weight, so it's a little annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope to catch up to him someday. Um, and then Dylan, um, I talked to him since last year, so me and him are pretty good buddies, and we always, like, we always want the best for each other, so that's also a nice part about it, because me and him always uh, like to joke around with each other and give each other form tips and stuff like that, because he can give me weight tips i can give them shot tips so it, it works very good in the end yeah great what's it like having other football players on the track and field team too like seneca moore we already saw him uh break a program record yeah. here so that's gotta be pretty cool to see no it's absolutely insane yeah the, the guy's a freshman and he yeah. already has a school record that's yeah. insane yeah <laughs> it's only going to get better <laughs> excellent well your thoughts you want to share on the main state meeting the experience there um you know kind of the biggest competition we've had so far really with you know track and field yeah. so far this year so this is the second time I've been there. I didn't compete the first time I went, which was last year. Oh, you just went? came to watch, sure. obviously. Yeah. And it was it was a very hype crowd. It was at Bates. And I really I, – like my favorite part about it was the um, – was like they turned the lights off and they have the relay. Blackout yeah, relay. Blackout relay. Yeah. That one all was so incredibly hype this year. On the throw side, we were – supposed to sweep most of the events mm-hmm. so we were supposed to i think we racked up 56 points for our team yeah which is a lot yeah for just two events so um we just had to make sure going in that we just did our jobs and you know tried to you know pr and move up a spot which one of our recent throwers solomon did which got us another point in oh the, nice in the end of things yep and um yeah it was hands down well 
so far the best experience I've had. Yeah. Awesome. So are you competing at the Valentine Invitational on Saturday? Or uh, no? no, the throwers don't do that. We go to Lynn Ruddy. You go to Lynn Ruddy. Ruddy. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. So um, another chance for another PR, I suppose. Right? Yeah, and yeah. Since I'm familiar with that circle because of high school, I hope oh. I can hit my 60 meters there and <laughs> get a ticket to nationals. That's my goal. Is that where you threw a lot in high school then? I threw there a fair amount. Um, yeah. USM was the place I threw in the most. Oh, so this past yeah. weekend was just like. Yeah, so it was just like, you know, high school. Yeah. Yeah, just you've seen it before. School. Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, Matt, thank you so much for watching the Bobcast. Congrats again. Your 10th all time in the indoor shot put here at Bates. Not an easy accomplishment, and uh, obviously still more room to move up those lists. Thanks yeah. again. No problem. On the women's side, senior captain Corinne Kullenberg won the 1,000 meters and helped the Bobcats win the 4x800 blackout relay, earning a pair of state titles. Her time with 3 minutes, 7.26 seconds in the 1K was also a personal record. Yeah, I started with the 1K, and then the 4x8 actually closed the meet for running events, so that was very exciting, and it was the traditional blackout 4x8, which falls in line with, I forget what year it happened, but there was one year where at the main state meet, the power went out during the 4x8, and so ever since, they turned the lights out to kind of remember that tradition, and Last year was the first year that the women um, participated in the tradition as well because they used to separate and have men and women in different locations. And I, I got to be a part of the inaugural 4x8 last year. Um, so it was really fun to have another chance with that this year and to anchor it as a senior. What was it like uh, running not completely in the dark, but probably pretty much in the dark, right? Yeah, the energy is wild. And at that point, like we're getting close to scoring the whole meet collectively and like the field events are still closing, but everybody's really like anxious to see how the points will end up with the relays. So there will be entire teams like surrounding each corner. And there was a, a whole, basically half the track where you were just running through a tunnel of sound with like, it was mostly Bowden and Bates, which made sense because we had the top one and two places in the meet and also in the relay. But so yeah, the whole team, if they're not still competing, is just cheering you on and really pushing you through in the last event. How close was it, or was it a pretty easy victory for the Bobcats? We weren't sure going in how it would be, but I think we really nailed down the order in which the relay went. We had um, first-year Meadow Gregory start, and she had some good competition with Bowden, and pulled away, I think, either in the second-to-last or the last lap, and was able to, like, get enough of a lead to help sophomore Evelyn Marchand um, start off with a bit of a lead in leg two. And then she handed off to sophomore Elizabeth Holcomb. And each leg, the gap widened a little bit more, which was exciting because, you know, when you're not the first leg, you're just waiting on the side, seeing what kind of race you're going to have. And by the time Elizabeth had the baton, like there was a wide enough gap where I, I knew we would we had a good chance of winning, but obviously you don't want to get too comfortable, especially like you never know who's going to be in the anchor leg. So yeah, when I, when I got the baton, we were already in the lead. And I think from what teammates said, the gap just widened from there. Um, yeah, I think we finished with maybe a 17 second lead <laughs> is what I heard. Yeah. That's quite a bit in track and field. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> especially when it's only a 200 meter track, but right. Yeah. Well, tell us, take us through your individual race. You won the 1,000 meters. Um, was that a close one, or were you able to pull away in that? Um, yeah, I followed I followed my race plan that I had discussed with Coach Feldman pretty, pretty much to a T, where um, I had the top seed going in, but he didn't want me to take it out. He wanted someone else to do that legwork for me, if possible. So he just said, like, let one or two people take it out, and if it's too slow in the first 200 or 400 meters take it but if not just sit on them and wait for the right time to make your move and like with it being the state meet and kind of a more local crowd like we really were trying to go for place um which if you're lucky going for place will also bring you to right. a good time too so I did just that I sat on I think it was a Colby girl who took the lead and I waited and I think I passed her going into two laps to go and then again just had the gap form um yeah I think it was a three second lead in that race excellent then does being from Maine kind of enhance the Maine State meet for you personally in terms of importance yeah it definitely <laughs> <laughs> like 
Maine State meet in high school definitely has a much stronger meaning behind it. Sure. Um, but still, like, there's so many people from Maine who end up going to school in Maine for college as well. And so I always see friends I knew from high school at meets like this. And so it still has that emphasis on community. Um, and it's fun to bring in teammates from other states and show them, like, this is this is why we chose to stay in Maine. Like, it's a pretty great community. <laughs> Great. And as a senior captain, kind of take us through um, maybe some other uh, races that really stood out on the women's side to you personally, just, you know, being a fan, a teammate watching everything, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we had the, for for track events, um, the 5K really started us off. Um, we had Gwen Anderson have a really big PR, first time sub-19 in the 5K, so that really stood out. Um, and similarly, Liam Thompson, he like totally left it all out there and dove at the end of his 5k <laughs> performance got all scraped up and got some points for us there um senior captain maddie lee keeps shaving more time off in her 400 which is really impressive because obviously like the shorter the event is the harder it is to keep making improvements especially when you've been doing it for so many years um we also had kylie Masanti, who's new to track um she uh, coach joked that we kind of stole her from soccer, but she'll be back for soccer too. But yeah, she had her debut in the 600, which was very impressive. Um, yeah, we also had like going into this meet, if you hadn't, um, if you hadn't run your event before, you had to be entered with no time. So there, it was harder like with the seeds to make sure you were placed in a heat that would maximize your ability to have competition. So like it was um, in the 800, I believe, where we had Ross win from the slow heat, which was also very impressive. Oh, to interesting. See. Like, okay, yeah. Because obviously less competition, you're out there on your own. But yeah, also James Guiney, like continuing to have very impressive throws in weight throw. So yeah, we had a lot of very standout performances, which is always exciting, especially like emphasizing the local schools and teams to still come out as a standout team. Yeah, I mean, to win the whole event from, quote-unquote, the slow heat is right. uh, <laughs> it's pretty difficult to do. I, you don't see that very often, right? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so take us through that from people who don't realize, like, why is it important to have people with similar speeds to you in your heat to perform your best? Yeah, um, especially I feel like for the distance events, um, with pacing being so important, like – throughout the whole thing you want to make sure right from the start you're hitting the right splits every 200 and if you're in a heat where people are just hitting a totally different split than what you're aiming for it's it's hard because you really have to put yourself out there immediately as soon as the gun goes off and know that you might be alone the whole time but you just have to pretend that there's people with you pushing you even if that's not the way your heat worked out so yeah definitely to be able to not only win your heat but to beat all the people in the fast heats where they have the neck and neck competition it's definitely definitely impressive <laughs> excellent now this weekend you're competing at the valentine invitational down at boston university a very very fast track maybe the fastest track in the country perhaps um you're running the 3k though this time right take us through the strategy behind you know changing up events for this weekend yeah, I'll be in the 3K on Friday. Um, they split up the meet, so women are on Friday, men are on Saturday. Um, I, I was just checking the entries this morning. I think there's something like 295 women in the 3K alone. So, um, again, like this is definitely one where you will have competition <laughs> in every single heat. Like Everyone in your heat is expected to be able to run around the exact same time. So... If you're lucky, you can have people just pull you to a PR. And, yeah, the 3K, definitely a little longer of an event. So um, it's it's definitely more important to make sure that you're in it mentally. Um, with the shorter events, you can kind of just let your mind go blank and just try to be fast every time. But with the, something like the 3K, you just have to really tell yourself to keep pushing when it's getting really hard. And, yeah, I for a while I've as I'm sure with many other people I've struggled with the middle laps because mm. at the beginning and end you have so much adrenaline but in the middle things get really tough so yeah I think 
when I ran the 3K um, at our home meet a few weeks ago, I think something that helped was just um, almost pretending it was like a workout. I had a bunch of my teammates in the race too, and the way we run our workouts, we like we go in this line, we call it the choo-choo train, and we take turns who's leading, and you know that if you don't hit the paces, your teammates behind you are going to have their workout compromised. So like sometimes that can help in a race setting to just – imagine that if I if I don't hit my pace my teammates are gonna be compromised so even though I won't have teammates in that event this weekend I'm still gonna imagine them there with me throughout the race excellent and then um your mom's a track coach right yeah so what was it like growing up to have a mom who's a coach and then you getting into that sport yourself it's helped me so much with my mindset one of the things I admire most about my mom's coaching style is her emphasis on the mental aspect because like when it comes to race day even it doesn't matter how fit you are if you don't have that mental piece like you're not going to be able to perform at your best and something she would always do is she'd have all these books and articles and have different excerpts that she would read before each meet and they'd be like tailored to what we needed to do on that day and she'd read them on the bus um most of the time like right before we got to the competition and yeah so sometimes I I circle back to those and have a little refresher and remember those pep talks beforehand but yeah definitely that's something that's really helped me was having that early practice with mental strength. Terrific. What well, are your thoughts you wanted to share on the main state meet we haven't got to talk about yet? Yeah, just like great energy. I feel like our team has really bonded a lot in the past few weeks. Um, I'm excited to see how the rest of the season goes and also excited for how the outdoor season will go. Yeah. All right, Corinne Kohlenberg, two state titles there on Saturday in the 4x800 Blackout Relay and the 1,000 meters as well. Thanks so much for joining us on the Bobcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. The squash teams had their senior day last Wednesday, and while the women's team lost a 5-4 to four heartbreaker to Bowdoin, senior captain Andy Martigon won her match at the top of the lineup and has been on a roll, having won five straight. The number seven seed Bobcats take on number two seed Tufts in the NETSCAC championships this Saturday at Amherst. Andy Martigon with us here on the Bobcast talking some women's squash. And first of all, Andy, you're the only senior on the women's squash team. So what was senior day like? You had to make a big deal about it on the glass court before the match and everything. What was that like for you, you know, having you know, your your teammates celebrate you and everything? It was honestly very special. It's It always felt weird in the past three years that I was the only senior. But I liked it a lot. It was very much personalized. It was kind of like as the only senior, obviously, I had all the attention um, and then in the men's team, there's also one senior. So it was kind of fun just to have the both of us be celebrated um, last Wednesday. And then for your, yourself personally, you've won five straight matches individually. So what's really been clicking for you there at the top of the lineup recently? Um, I think at this point, um, I've acquired a lot of experience. So I think that's helped me a lot throughout the past couple of years. And so, honestly, I didn't even keep count until you mentioned it. <laughs> but, yeah, definitely, I I think that's partly why um, the streak keeps going up. So, hopefully, it stays the same. Well, I was going to say, you're playing Tufts in the NESCAC quarterfinals this weekend, a team that, you know, you all, you all just played. It was 6-3, to three, but there were a couple of matches that went five games. It could have gone the other direction. So, what are your thoughts on this on NESCAC quarterfinal coming up? I'm excited to play them again because obviously the results that we got, even though we lost, um, were super, super great because they're this number two seed in the NESCAC. And so I thought everyone pushed really hard in the team. And so now that we play them in kind of a more formal setting, that it's um, the NESCAC cha championships, I think I'm confident it's going to go really well. It's going to be fun for for the whole team. Well, and they've changed the format of NESCAC since you've been here, actually. It's now a single elimination event. So what are your thoughts on how it used to be where you'd have like a constellation bracket and stuff versus what it is like now? I personally think that's how it should be because uh -huh. there's no point of playing for position number five, position number six. That's To me, that's nonsense. Either you're top two, top three, or nothing. Like, it, it doesn't really count. So I like that. It, it puts more pressure on us. So I think it's a great thing. Excellent. Do you think you'll be playing the same opponent, or do you think Tufts might mix up their lineup? <laughs> 
Ooh, that's a tricky question. I doubt they're going to change their lineup just because they've been playing with the same lineup the whole season. So right. it would it would honestly change a lot of things, but I wouldn't mind playing the same girl. She, I thought she was she was great on court and I enjoyed the match. So I I hope I play the same person. Bill, what's the key to victory in that matchup? I mean, does it does it change based on who you're playing kind of? Yeah, I think um, this is this would be the third time I play her, so it it doesn't. I don't think it's gonna make things easier. The fact that I played her uh, twice already, but it definitely is better than playing someone that I don't know, just because um, I wouldn't know what their strategy or their their game. So I think it's, I think it's gonna be. A really close match again. She's definitely coming for revenge. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you know, you being a senior captain and a women's team in general being pretty young, a lot of first years sophomores getting a lot of playing time in upper parts of the lineup. Just from your observations this year, what have you seen from some of the younger players? You know, immediately getting tossed into college squash and really, you know, having some uh, pretty cool early success, right? Yeah, I think they've made a lot of improvement. Um, a lot of them are international, so they don't even know how the U.S. Um, squash system works and I feel like they've adapted to the system pretty well and also just to the team in general. I mean, they're kind of half the team. So um, I think by now we all get along pretty well and I hope that they are as excited as I am for this weekend. Um, I'm pretty sure they are. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the next two weeks because we have NESCACs and then we have Nationals. So. Right. Yeah. I know the team last year finished pretty strong at team nationals. I mean, I know you obviously want to go to a little bit higher flight this year. You're right there at kind of 19th, right? So what do you have to do to maybe get to a slightly higher flight this season? Or where are you, where are you looking at right now, I guess? Well, yeah. So as you said, last year we were in the last flight, in the bottom flight, I think. So hopefully if we are in the top 15 or 20, we will play a flight up. And I'm pretty sure we already are. So that's already a good thing. But obviously, um, when we play nationals, we would want to end up higher. Definitely not to drop more um, spots in the ranking. And it's always our, our goal to win the last match. So hopefully it stays the same. Yeah, definitely a win over Tufts in the quarterfinals would go a long ways to helping you play at a higher flight. Um, Annie, any other thoughts you want to share on the season so far and what's upcoming we haven't got to talk about yet? Um, It honestly went by pretty quick. <laughs> I feel like January is always our busiest month because we're, um, this year, since we're um away mostly, I don't think I've spent a single weekend here at Bates. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's been a very long season for all of us, I'm sure. Everyone is excited to play Nationals, NESCACs, and if we qualify for college individuals, then that would, that would be great as well. Um, but yeah, we're all pretty, I don't think anyone's burnt out yet. I think we're all still wanting to beat some people, so... <laughs> Sounds good. And everyone can find the links to uh, watch the action there at Amherst, where Bates is taking on Tufts in the NESCAC quarterfinals this Saturday. Uh, go BatesBobcats.com. Andy, thanks so much for joining us on the Bobcats. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. The men's squash team will be the eighth seed in the upcoming NESCAC tournament and will take on top seed Trinity Saturday at Amherst in the quarterfinals. The skiing teams combined for an eighth place showing at the Harvard Carnival out of 14 EISA schools, and the Bobcats are back in action this weekend at the Dartmouth Carnival. You can find the complete schedule and all the latest results online at GoBaitsBobcats.com, and we'll catch you next time on the Bates Bobcast.